Hello, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Schramm. I'm a product manager on the AR team. Uh, I'm joined here by two of my colleagues, Leon and Christina. Uh, and we're here to talk to you today about what we've been up to lately with AR Core. Uh, I wanted to start out, though, by giving some quick context. Uh, it's been a big year for AR, uh, but we're really just getting started. Last year at I.O., our AR platform wasn't even a year old. But everything we've done before and everything we're doing now really goes back to a pretty simple question. That smartphone camera is less and less a camera in any traditional sense, almost like your smartphone is less and less a phone in any traditional sense. You really don't need to take much of a step back to remember that it was pretty recently that cameras were for taking snapshots and not much more. But this idea of AR stemmed from kind of a collective realization that these cameras we all carry around in our pockets, they happen to be attached to these like, little supercomputers that are also packed with sensors. And so the question AR asks is, what could we do if we thought about these cameras themselves as one of the richest of all the available sensors, a sensor that we can hold up to the world and use what we see as core input? And from that stems also like really a pretty simple observation that the richer the set of inputs you give a computing device, the richer the set of outputs it can produce. And this isn't a new thing. This is really true for like the whole history of computing. The like, punch card gives way to the keyboard, the mouse, the touchscreen voice, so on and so on. But given that AR experiences can be within the world itself, there's really no limit to the richness of the experiences we can ultimately produce. To get more specific, when I say richer inputs, I mean going way beyond the sorts of things we mostly feed into phones right now, things like touches, swipes, numbers, letters, emojis. <laughs> These are distinctly not the, human, the inputs that humans use to perceive the world. Humans, like we perceive that the world has uh, like three dimensions, that it has things in it that have shapes and mass, uh, and we're super attuned to things like light coming from different directions and different sources and reflecting off different materials. But our phones are basically clueless about these things until quite recently. So when we combine the incoming visual data from a camera with a bunch of other sensors and computing resources like IMUs and GPUs and ML models and software algorithms, we can begin to give our phones some of the same understanding of the world that we have. And so in AR terms, this means things like Sixth off tracking, or plane finding, light estimation, or super precise shared localization. And once you give a computer these sorts of richer inputs, you can produce really powerful new outputs. You can do what Stream is doing and overlay a how to video about how to change the oil in your car directly above the place where the oil goes. You can even call in a remote expert to help you find specific parts of the engine right in front of you. Or you can turn a smartphone into the world's quickest and easiest tape measure, one that's always with you, one that doesn't always get lost in your junk drawer just when you need it. Or within Google Maps, you can take a set of walking directions, and you can place navigational aids right where you need them, within the world itself. It's like a set of dynamic road signs placed just for you. You can also create wholly new types of gameplay, like Tendar, a game from Tender Claws that uses facial expressions and emotions to create a narrative around a virtual object. In this case, it's a guppy that feeds off of human emotion. Can you imagine like, how crazy this pitch would have sounded even in 2015? But it's totally possible now, and it's really fun. Or you can create the types of, of scenes previously only possible within like the CGI lab within a Hollywood studio, where you can place digital characters into the world such that they feel like they're right there with you. We are working so hard on AR at Google because we believe it unlocks a new set of applications that are creative and helpful in ways we could only imagine a few years ago. AR can be uniquely helpful because it can present useful, important information within the most relevant context, the world itself. And as we said before, it gives you the ability to use what you see as a fundamental input into your computing. 
And at the very least, it saves you from having to like, type those 1,000 words each picture is worth. On the creative side, what you see and what the camera perceives can become a wholly new mechanic for games or self-expression. And the creative digital outputs of artists, storytellers, and game designers can now inhabit the same spaces we do as people. Enabling exactly these sorts of experiences is why we are building AR Core. Our goal with AR Core is to give developers like yourselves simple and powerful tools for bridging the digital and physical world. So today, we're going to give you a recap of the progress we've made over the last year, and then we're going to walk through a bunch of new things we're bringing to the platform. To start with, I'm most excited to say that since last year, we've almost quadrupled the number of AR Core enabled devices bringing that number to an estimated 400 million. And we did this by working really closely with top Android OEMs to ensure new devices are AirCore compatible at launch. That also means the number of AirCore devices will just keep growing as these new phones sell into market. And we've also worked with lots of developers, like all of you, to expand the number of Air applications available. In fact, there's now a dedicated section of the Google Play Store that features over 3,000 AirCore applications. Here are some of our recent favorites. Here's Pharos, which uses cloud anchors to let multiple players share a journey through a universe created by Childish Gambino. Or there's the Color Snap Visualizer. It's an app from Sherwin-Williams that lets you see what a new shade of paint looks like on your walls without having to like, slap the paint on. Or there's GeoDribba's 3D graphing calculator that lets you create 3D math plots, place them in your space, and explore them by walking around. The simple breadth of things that we've seen developers create in a relatively short period has been remarkable. And we really hope to see even more interesting things with some of the improvements we'll dive into now. With that, I'd like to turn it over to one of the lead engineers on our team, Leon. Thanks, Ben. Thanks a lot, Ben. Well, I can't really believe that it's been a whole year since the last Google I.O. And over that time, we've released six updates to AR Core, and we've made improvements to almost every part of the platform, from algorithmic quality to developer tools, and we've also added some great new capabilities. I'd love to share some of the highlights with you today, starting with improvements to some of the fundamentals upon which all AR experiences are built. Continuing to improve the quality of our motion tracking and environmental understanding algorithms has been a top focus for us. Not only does this create more reliable and uh, enjoyable user experiences, but we've seen that improvements to the algorithms th that underlie AR Core have boosted AR Core user engagement and retention across a broad range of applications. One of our biggest achievements in the last year was improving AR Core motion tracking robustness by 30%, with a large part of that coming from better sensor calibration algorithms that have helped. AR Core adapt to the diversity of hardware in the Android ecosystem. Now, there are always going to be some cases where tracking simply fails. You know, people will put their phones in their pockets, people will shake their phones too hard, and it won't always be possible for us to maintain tracking quality in those cases. So, we feel that one of the most important things we can do is educate users about how tracking works and what they can do to improve their own experiences. That's why we introduced an API to report tracking failure reasons. For example, when there's not enough visual texture in a scene to allow our cameras to track motion, or there's simply too little light in the, the environment, or when there's excessive motion that saturates inertial sensors or can cause camera motion blur. By providing this kind of feedback to applications, we hope that apps will be able to guide users toward more successful AR experiences. Plane finding is another experience that's been a key focus for our engineering team. Now, plane finding is, for a very large percentage of apps, is one of those things you have to do in order to place AR content and begin the overall AR experience that people are trying to get into. But what's not really clear to users is that we need particular kinds of camera movements in order to find planes successfully. AR Core triangulates where visual features are in three-dimensional space by seeing them from multiple different perspectives. So large, gentle motions focusing on the target area of interest really work best. 
Rather than making users learn how to do this better, however, we've focused on reducing the amount of user motion that our algorithms require by increasing the number and types of visual features that we're using to locate planes. This has improved plane finding speed and success rates dramatically. For example, in Google's own AR measurement application, we saw a 50% reduction in the amount of time it takes to find an initial plane. To see this in action, take a look at the graphic on the screen. It's really hard to see, but if you look at how little camera motion is needed before you see the dots that indicate we found the floor plane, you'll see just what kind of progress we've made over the last year. Keep looking, and there it is. It's almost instantaneous in a lot of cases. Camera quality is another fundamental part of nearly every AR experience. When AirCore launched, we optimized camera configurations for visual tracking performance. So we did things like we fixed focus at infinity to make it easier to model camera focal lengths. And we tightly controlled exposure settings, frame rates, and resolutions to prevent motion blur and limit compute. This made our computer vision challenges a lot more tractable, but it really wasn't ideal for many end user applications. For example, AR photography has grown into a really important use case for us, and we really wanted to let AR take advantage of more of the camera capabilities that users expect from their devices. So over the la last year, we launched a number of important camera updates. We launched autofocus so that AR photographs are sharp even when scenes are close up. And we launched a feature called shared camera control. This is a feature that lets applications quickly switch between visual tracking mode for the camera and a mode that's controlled by the application so that they can choose to do things like take higher resolution photographs. And then finally, we doubled your fun by adding front facing camera support so you can take those all important AR selfies. So in addition to working on the quality and reliability of AirCore end user experiences, we also invested in our development tools to help application creators work more efficiently and take advantage of our latest features. For Java developers, three, dealing with 3D graphics can be a real challenge. So we launched SceneForm at I.O. last year. SceneForm makes it easy to create 3D scene graphs and render them realistically, all without the complexity of OpenGL. Since our launch uh, of SceneForm last year, we expanded its capabilities in a lot of different ways. So for example, we added uh, support for external dynamic textures to allow you to do high quality video playbacks in your applications. We added screen recording to help developers capture demo videos and let users scare, share screenshots on social media. And we added animation support so that your 3D assets can come to life in AR. And then finally, We've tried to keep SceneForm up to date by supporting the latest AR core features like augmented faces. Now, for developers uh, working in Unity instead of Java for their application development workflow, we've been regularly updating our AR core SDK for Unity, so it always showcases the best of AR core's growing platform capabilities. But because we know that many application developers are building cross platform applications, We've also worked closely with Unity on their AR Foundation package. AR Foundation lets developers use a core set of augmented reality features across both ARKit on iOS and AR Core on Android, all using a common API so that you can maintain a single code base for your apps. And to make those cross-platform experiences even better, we brought key AR Core features uh, to iOS, like Cloud Anchors, which lets, uh, lets developers create multi-user AR, experience, AR experiences that are all anchored in the same physical location. Now, effective user interaction design is just as much of a challenge for AR as software development. And designers are still feel, figuring out what's working best for their applications and use cases. In order to help with this problem, we. It, introduced AirCore Elements. AirCore Elements is a set of UI components that Google has designed and validated with user testing. You can use AirCore Elements to insert common AR interaction patterns like plane finding and object manipulation into your Unity apps, all without having to reinvent the wheel. 
This helps users learn actions that they can perform across different applications, and it also makes it easier to follow Google's recommended AR user experience guidelines. So those were some examples of the many updates and improvements we've made to AR Core in the last year. Now we'd like to share some of our newest capabilities, including several that are launching this week. From the start, the mission of AirCore has been to give developers the ability to create more realistic experiences that are available to more users and in more places. And we wanted to give our devices the ability to see and understand the world in much the same way that we do, and to fully engage our own human senses with, by rendering digital content in context with the highest levels of realism. So let's start by looking at some of the new visual perception capabilities that we've added to AirCore to make it more useful in more contexts. By human standards, AirCore launched with some pretty limited visual perception capabilities. We could detect horizontal planes, we can de and soon after, we added support for vertical planes. And this was really important for allowing applications to place AR objects in places like floors, on tables, and on walls where real objects often lie. But what we care about so much more than objects in many of our life experiences are people. So with this in mind, we felt that one of the most important canvases for AR should be the human face. And this really isn't a very new idea, if you think about it. We've been augmenting faces with masks, makeup, and face paint for as long as we can all remember. So it's not really that surprising that people are really excited to take these experiences to a new level in AR. But high-quality, three-dimensional face perception is a really difficult technical challenge. Faces are complex 3D surfaces, and people are highly attuned to the smallest shifts in expression. Furthermore, like faces are deformable, and face tracking solutions need to work across diverse face shapes, hairstyles, skin colors, and age groups. So to solve these problems and help a wide range of developers be able to launch face-based AR applications, we launched Augmented Faces recently. Augmented Faces for front-facing cameras provides a high-quality 468-point three-dimensional mesh that tracks head movements and changing facial expressions. Best of all, we use machine learning, so this works on devices without depth sensors. Now, if you think about the level of realism uh, that you can achieve between a, the difference in realism that you can achieve between a plastic mask and motion capture-based CGI effects, you'll start to understand why we're so excited about what developers are going to do with these high-quality face meshes. Augmented Faces is unlocking new use cases for photography, social media, and commerce. We're seeing really strong interest from brands and retailers for use cases like makeup and uh, try on, trying on makeup, hair colors, eyeglasses, and accessories. And of course, people are creating tons of fun photos with everything from beauty effects to face morphing and so much more. In fact, interest in augmented faces has been so high that we've decided to bring augmented faces to I and make it available on iOS this summer. It'll have the same high-quality 468-point face mesh as Android and will work on all ARKit-capable devices without requiring a depth sensor. And after we launch, developers will be able to create augmented faces applications that have the potential to reach a billion users across iOS and Android. One of the first cross-platform experiences to take advantage of this will be Meitu's Beauty Plus application which will feature, <laughs> I see there's some May 2 fans back there, right on. Uh, and uh, so Beauty Plus will feature a number of great face effects, including uh, this example, which is a little gem that Ben's been playing with. Uh, in the experience here, uh, it tosses a birthday cake in your face. And um, true story, we actually couldn't figure out how to make it work. Um, we tried and tried. And then we realized that the trigger for the birthday cake is actually when you open your mouth in order to blow out the birthday candle. Perfectly natural. But it's that little moment of surprise and delight when you figure that out that represents the kind of moments we hope more developers will create uh, when they use augmented faces. 
And if you're here with us on site, uh, please try augmented faces out for yourselves. Uh, it's, there's a demo out in the sandbox area behind the tent. And uh, you can try a photo booth experience where you can create some neat selfies that you can share with your friends and followers. So now I'd like to talk about a different class of visual perception that we're adding to phones. And we think it has just as much potential to be helpful and fun as, as augmented faces. And that category is augmented images. Think about all the 2D images in our space. There's maps, signs, posters, labels. These are the main ways we annotate our physical space with information. They're cheap, they're easy to print, they're easy to place, and they're everywhere. Now think about how much more useful these things would be if your phone could recognize and transform each one into the anchor for an interactive 3D experience. That was the vision that prompted us to develop augmented faces and launch it earlier this year. Version one of augmented faces had some limitations, however. It used image detection and object pose estimation algorithms that were too expensive for us to run on every single camera frame. So what we did was we actually used AR core motion tracking to do th uh, 3D updates uh, to, the, um, to render 3D perspectives on your AR content as your device moved. So the results here were very high quality, but this only works when your target image is static. So it limited the set of use cases we could support. To overcome this limitation, we significantly revamped the computer vision algorithms behind augmented images. And in AR Core version 1.9, which is launching this week, we've added the ability to track moving target images. Along with these algorithmic changes, we've improved image detection recall by 15%. We've boosted tracking precision by 30%. And we've gained the ability to track multiple objects in the same frame. So with moving augmented images, you can now do things like attach AR content to movable objects, like product boxes, printed documents, and game pieces, like in this example from JD.com, which is a children's spelling game. In this game, once you spell a word correctly, it, shows you, it gives you positive feedback by showing you that word in action. You can also do things like alter physical reality with moving augmented images. So in this example called Notable Women, uh, which is a collaboration between Google Collab Creative Lab and Rosie Rios, who is the 43rd treasurer of the United States, um, the application highlights the achievements of notable historical American women by swapping their faces onto US currency. The level of realism here is only possible with the improvements we've made to augmented images. So that was just a quick introdu introduction to augmented faces and augmented images. But if you're learning, interested in learning more about these technologies and using them in your own applications, please join us at tomorrow afternoon's dedicated session. So now that we've had a chance to look at some of AirCore's new visual perception capabilities, I'd like to turn things over to Christina, who's going to talk about the ways we're bringing greater, greater, we're bringing greater realism and utility to AirCore. Thank you, Leon. One of AR's fundamental goals is to blend the virtual with the real. I want to really believe that that virtual pet is here with me and that couch that I'm thinking about buying, I want to see it in AR in my living room as if it were actually there. And realism really matters for immersion. Just think about the difference between great and not so great CGI in the movies. Having realism really helps to keep users grounded in that experience and engaged with that experience. And one of the key parts to making AR real is to get the lighting right. Let's take a look at why. So take a look at this picture. What do you see? I think it's a pretty simple photo. We have a chair, a plant, and a mirror, all against a simple wooden wall here. But there are actually so many human perceptual cues that we see in the scene, and we think about these and use them subconsciously to understand what's happening in the scene. 
One of those perceptual cues is specular highlights, which are shiny spots that appear on objects when light illuminates them. Another perceptual cue is shadows, areas that are darker because less light falls on them because that light is blocked by other objects. We also see differences in shading. Some, obje some objects are angled differently from the camera. They are farther away or closer to us. Or they have different material properties, like being less or more reflective. So we can see that even in a simple image like this, we actually have so many different perceptual cues that we use to understand what's going on. These are the inputs to our understanding. And the output is that we actually understand that in this scene, the light is coming from the front right of the scene, and that the light is actually pretty bright. Now, what if we wanted to add an AR object into this scene, but maybe an AR object that we wouldn't normally see in a scene like this, like this rocket? Now, note here that the rocket is pretty shiny. It's very reflective. It has details like the rivets, and it's got a reflective window. The rocket's also casting a nice soft shadow on the ground. We're going to put this scene, this rocket, into the scene that we just saw. And we're going to use a very common heuristic to light it. That heuristic will be to take the average brightness of the pixels in the scene. And we're going to apply that to the rocket's surface equally as ambient illumination. Now, ambient light gives the same light and intensity to every object and every surface in the scene from no particular direction. For a shiny object like this, we're going to see that using ambient illumination only to light the object doesn't necessarily result in the prettiest result. As you can see here, this doesn't look quite right. Now, what is really great is that the rocket is anchored onto the floor. One of the first steps towards having a realistic AR experience is to actually have your objects look like they're sitting there and grounded on the floor. But this rocket doesn't have a shadow. And it looks really dark, because its material here is kind of dark. And there isn't, isn't enough energy from the ambient intensity only to create that shininess. Now, there are some tricks we could use to fix this, like lightening the overall material. But then, the rocket might look too bright in other scenes. And we still wouldn't capture any of the shininess or the shadows that we want to see on a real object. What we would really want, ideally, is to be able to actually understand where light is coming from in the scene from 360 degrees and in high dynamic range, which is the range of light that humans see. Ideally, we would also want AirCore to do, us, to do this for us out of the box. The result might look something like this. On the right-hand side, we can see that this rocket looks much more real and integrated into the scene. Notice how the shadows on the legs of the rocket actually match the shadow direction coming off of the legs of the planter in the scene. Notice how the specular highlights on the rocket also match the direction of the light coming in. As much as you might be able to believe that a rocket would actually be in a scene like this, this one really looks like it's there. So today, we're excited to announce new AR Core APIs that will allow you to render realistic AR assets like the one on the right. In fact, the image on the right was captured live on a Pixel 3 running our new APIs. Out of the box, these new APIs will provide three things, directional lighting, ambient spherical harmonics, and a cube map for reflections. So let's walk through what each of those APIs can provide us by looking at a live demo. We're going to welcome Ben back to the stage to help with that. Thank you. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is to place the rocket back into the scene with ambient illumination only. As we can see here, it doesn't look very grounded or realistic. There's no shadow. But one of the simplest things that we could do is to add in a shadow. Unfortunately, without these new APIs, we wouldn't actually know where the strongest light in the scene is coming from. But we could do the simplest and naive thing here, which is to put a single directional light from directly above and going down at the ground. So let's take a look at what that looks like. 
It's looking a little better. We can see the specular highlights on the top of the rocket, and we can see a soft shadow on the bottom of the rocket. But as Ben will show you, that shadow doesn't actually match the direction of the shadows that are on the table and of the chair. So in a second, we're actually going to turn on the environmental HDR lighting. And we're going to see how this shadow will actually immediately change to match the shadows in the scene. And we're going to see that because we're understanding light's direction in the scene. So as you can see here, using machine learning, our algorithm has actually noticed where the strongest directional light is coming from and rendered that onto the rocket. Now, you can see the shadows in the same direction. But you'll recall that the rocket is supposed to be pretty shiny. And this rocket that we see in the scene right now isn't quite shiny yet. What we need is a way to get realistic reflections from all directions. And to do that, we're going to turn on the cube map, which is also provided by our new APIs. Now we can see that it's turned on. You can see that the shadows, reflections, and the lighting on the rocket really match those of the surroundings. Even, on, even in the stage lighting that we have here, which is a fairly unnatural environment to be standing on a stage, um, we can see that our estimation of where the light is coming from really works. Thank you, Ben, for the demo. So one other thing to note is that the lighting on this stage was pretty static during the demo. But in the real world, lights are often dynamic. Let's go back to the slides here, and we're going to take a look at what happens when the lights are dynamic. So environmental HDR lighting also works even when the lights are moving around in the scene, as you can see right here. Now, one of these figures is virtual. And we're going to take a quick vote to see if you can tell. Uh, raise your hand if you think the one on your left is virtual. All right. Raise your hand if you think the one on uh, this side on your right is virtual. All right. And raise your hand if you can't quite tell. All right. So we fooled some of you. Uh, the one on your right-hand side is the real mannequin, and the one on your left-hand side is a virtual mannequin placed in AR. And we can see that the lighting on both is reacting dynamically, realistically, as the light in the scene pans from left to right. And this footage was also captured live on a smartphone. If you're at I.O., you can see this scene for yourself today in the sandbox. Now, you might be wondering, do I have to know all about specular highlights and shadows and the rest to be able to use this in my app? Uh, don't worry, you don't. Uh, we take care of that for you. So these APIs will work for you out of the box. But I want to give you a little sneak peek at the challenges we overcame and some of the machine learning magic that we use for this feature. So we really had to overcome two key challenges. The first challenge is that cell phones have a really limited field of view. In fact, your cell phone only sees 6% of the 360 degrees around you. The second challenge is that phones see in low dynamic range. So you and I, humans, we can generally see very bright and very dark. And we can tell the difference between those extremes. But your cell phone uh, can see some bright and some dark. And the range between those is not very large. That's low dynamic range. So our challenge was to convert a single low dynamic range frame that sees 6% of the world and extrapolate from that 360 degree lighting in HDR. So we do this with machine learning using a TensorFlow light neural net and training samples like the one pictured here. So you don't have to worry about sensing perceptual cues and translating that into AR lighting. We'll take care of that for you. If you're interested in learning the details and how we developed this feature and how to use it in your app, please attend tomorrow morning's dedicated session. So again, that's environmental HDR lighting coming this summer to all AR core phones. It will help your users to experience true realism and immersion in the apps that you build. Now, we've just talked about exciting features like realistic lighting, augmented faces, augmented images, and more. But we also want to make it really easy to bring AR core features to your users. 
We want to make it easy for people to access compelling AR experiences from your website. So today, we're introducing Scene Viewer. Scene Viewer is a 3D and AR viewer that runs natively on Android and allows users to seamlessly put any 3D content from your website into your space, just like this penguin. Now, this penguin is being launched straight from Google search into my space in its lifelike size. You may have seen something like this in the consumer keynote this morning. Now, what's really important is that the best of AR Core will work out of the box with Scene Viewer. That includes motion tracking, plane finding, and more. And the environmental HDR lighting you just saw will be coming soon to Scene Viewer as well. You can even add in context titles and call to actions for your users. In the flow that's pictured here, I'm thinking about buying a new chair, and I want to put it in my bedroom. To do that, I want to use Scene Viewer to actually view that chair in my space. So in the rightmost image here, we have the AR chair placed into the real bedroom. And the nice thing is that from that AR view, I can actually directly intent to the URL that will allow me to purchase that chair. Now, let's take a look at how easy it is to use Scene Viewer. You may know about Model Viewer, which is an open source cross-browser web component that allows users to see objects in 3D in the browser. Scene Viewer will work hand in hand with Model Viewer. Whenever Scene Viewer is available, Model Viewer will seamlessly intent out to it. All it takes to enable Scene Viewer is to add two letters, two letters only, to the HTML tag. Not surprisingly, those two letters are A and R. Next, let's take a look at an example where Model Viewer intents out seamlessly to Scene Viewer. We've been working with partners like NASA to bring their web content to life. This model of the Mars Curiosity rover goes straight from the web into your house. Whether it be for shopping or education, it is often dramatically more compelling to see objects in their real life size, to get up close to them, and to view them as if they were actually there in your space. If you're at I.O., you can also experience the Mars Curiosity rover in Scene Viewer in the AR sandbox. To learn more about how you can build amazing AR experiences, attend some of these upcoming sessions over the next few days. And you can check out our AR Core demos in Sandbox B. You can also come to our Code Labs for some detailed tutorials on how to use these features in your apps. So thank you so, so much for listening to this talk. We're really looking forward to see what you build in AR Core. Thank you.